My name is Rain, and these are my stories to tell. On the fourth anniversary of the day that I found out that my life wasn't what I thought it was, I am sharing with you my victim impact statement. Your Honor, I am one of the survivors of the defendant's unforgivable acts. To give you an understanding of the impact this crime continues to have on my and my child's life, let me take you back to June 2016 because I have heard various versions, assumptions, and interpretations from people involved in this case. I would like to voice my account as the defense so boldly emphasized in the preliminary, I never wanted to have a child, I never wanted to be a mother. My own parents, who lived in a third world country when they had me, first waited until they had enough money saved before they started trying to have children. I was born two years after they were married. They both had white collar jobs, my mother a state auditor and my father an engineer. They had support from both sides of their families and I grew up with a nanny. I knew I would never have that in Northern Nevada. The defendant and I eloped in April 2014 and I did not move in with him until September of that same year. We talked about moving to a different state but ended up staying with his parents while we both looked for good jobs. I took an administrative position and quickly worked my way back into accounting. The defendant and I moved into one or our own apartment in Sparks in June 2015, right before Tesla and the housing mess. Our rent was less than $800 for a one bedroom in a nice neighborhood. We paid off our debts, established some saving goals, and started talking about the possibility of a child. The defendant really wanted a mini-me, which I should have recognized as an omen. Because my body rejected almost every form of contraception, I heavily relied on the calendar method. I would let him know of my green calendar days and that is how I know the conception date. The child was planned. He was not some drunken mistake as the defendant had been telling the people. Father's Day 2016, I woke up early and took a pregnancy test. He was still asleep so I left it in the bathroom for him to find. No cute reveals of any sorts. I still was not sure if I wanted to be a mother, but now it is real. He seemed happy and excited. We did not tell anyone else right away or at least I did not. We told his parents in August 2016 while having dinner at the Nugget. I visited my father in California and told him I was pregnant but something must have been missed in the translation because he responded with do not have kids with him. Maybe he sent something that I did not. Since I did not have family in the Reno area, my co-workers filled the void. Between the parents and my office, there were three sets of twins and a dozen or so children total and plenty of pregnancy advice to go around. My favorite advice would be from a Latino researcher who chimed, You're the one carrying the child, your rules. I picked the OBGYN based on the fact that he also graduated from USC. The defendant accompanied me to, almost, to most of the visits until he found out we were having a boy. When we received the ultrasound disc, he wrote on it with a sharpie and underlined the word boy. He started making excuses as to why he could not come to the prenatal checkups. My regular OB went on vacation and I ended up switching to his colleague. She felt more like a mother figure to me, and even so, I still was not able to tell her what had happened until a few months later when I was trying to come to terms with the child's diagnosis. Monday, January 23, 2017, I was hoping to introduce the defendant to my new OB. I was 34 weeks pregnant and some would say pretty late to be switching doctors. He did not show up. I would later find evidence that he insisted instead spent the day with Jessica Amber Alvarez, one of his many mistresses. On Friday, January 27, 2017, 
I dropped him off at the Nuggets Brouhaha event sponsored by his then employer, Southern Glacier Wine and Spirit. We usually attended together, but given that I was 34 weeks pregnant, I told him my ticket should go to someone else. He supposedly picked a co-worker to go. He would eventually come home by cab after midnight. He was too drunk. He laid down on his side of the bed and a few minutes later threw up. I was 34 weeks pregnant and have never asked him to clean up after me. I tried to clean up his mess and I noticed that he also threw up on his phone. I wiped it. I have always trusted him and had no reason to suspect he was cheating. After all, he has always said that he would rather die than be divorced. Yet here he still is after his second divorce. But I digress. I found multiple messages from various women. I backed up his message to the cloud before promptly restarting it and wiping the memory clean. I tried to go back to bed and of course I could not. One of the messages that really stuck with me was from this woman named Tanya or maybe Tanya. She lives in Las Vegas and has been trying to convince the defendant to take a job down there. To prior praise what she said, just because you have kids does not mean you should stay together. She is right, you know, but I will never know now how right she was until the defendant raped me the following day. That whole Saturday, I reached out to friends online, to any of them who might sympathize with me, with what was happening. I delegate combing through his messages to someone else because my pregnancy brain just was not processing fast enough. I didn't even know that Jesse Dash merch on his phone was really Jessica Amber. My plan that I clearly laid out on the whiteboard on the side of our old fridge was to give birth and leave the child with his father. But you see, when Adam Michael Toombs raped me, he took away that option. No mother in their right mind would leave an infant with a rapist, much less her own rapist. I cannot tell you how mad I was with the trap that he created. If he was so unhappy with knowing that we were having a boy instead of a mini me like he envisioned then he should have said so and that led me to believe that we would be a family. One of my friends who read his messages would later tell me that he was already planning his new life with children with Jessica. All while telling Kendra Lane how beautiful she is and how he wants to name his future Tundra truck after her. I did not leave our shared housing until May 26, 2017, and not because I thought our relationship would still work. Housing prices had gone up and I was paying half of my paycheck to childcare. I also believed that if he really wanted to start life over with someone else, then they should then why should I and my child be inconvenienced just so his mistress can move in? I found a single mother who was renting a room so she could afford to continue where she lived with her three children under 8 years old. I took the day off and with the help of some co-workers, moved what I could. I left a lot of stuff behind including a photo of the child and I as a reminder to the defendant. He did not even look for us and he blamed me for his girlfriend breaking up with him. I received a random text from him asking, not asking about the child, but asking if I took the waffle maker. One of my few possessions because who doesn't love a good waffle? I did not file for divorce until that one fateful day in June 2018 when I received an unsolicited picture of his brand new 2018 Toyota Tundra with the caption, must be nice to have that kind of money. The logical accountant in me snapped. Here I was pinching pennies to make sure that I could keep a roof over our head, afford a $1,040 per month childcare, and provide for this now medically complex child. And he is just spending money on a new truck? I contacted a lawyer and told her everything including the rape. I had no intention to file a case and I remember telling my lawyer and the detective that I really just want to protect the child. I do not want to share custody with my rapist. I gave my statement to Detective Adonko in August 2018 and did not know that anything would come out of it until I received a subpoena to testify. I started going to therapy around the same time I filed for divorce back in June 2018. 
I went every other week because I felt guilty for taking the time off for the child's various appointments. At some point, his pediatrician signed off on FMLA paperwork for me. I held on to the hope of being promoted despite what is happening with my personal life. At the time, I was making at least 20% less than the people who are performing similar or less functions. I cannot put a price tag on the opportunities that I have missed by being the default parent. However, there is a clear monetary value to the price I paid my lawyer. To this day, I still have her on retainer to ensure that my and my child's best interests are represented in court as the defendant continue to claim that he will be posting bail soon despite his federal hold. Between August 2018 and the time I received a request from a Department of Homeland Security detective, I entertained and almost welcomed the idea of supervised visitation. Maybe he has changed, but he has not, and I have learned that he has only gotten worse. After meeting with the federal detective, I contacted my lawyer and we filed an emergency motion to suspend his supervised visitation until the new case is closed. The subpoena could not have come at a worse time. April of 2019, the month the child needed to start wearing custom-made $1,800 plus or totics for his right leg was the same month I asked to justify I was asked to justify staying with the defendant. Under oath, I tried to bottle up my rage and calmly make my statements. If someone can hurt you while you are pregnant with their child, they will hurt that child too. I was dreading the day that I needed to justify why I stayed. I could not just leave the child with a rapist. My carefully crafted plan of exiting the defendant's life and never looking back was shattered on the day he raped me and in his word, so he could delete Jesse's phone number. 775-338-3862 I left court continuing to ask myself why I stayed, but the better question is, why am I staying as a mother? I have found a more than suitable, loving and caring family for the child. They stepped up and has known him since he was six months old. Today, the child sees at least five different therapists and he will soon be assessed by child fine for his further needs. The defendant has excused me multiple times of making up the disability and refuses to acknowledge the level of care required. Nevada barely has the services he needs and he has recently received his first out-of-state referral. I urge the court to apply the maximum sentence. I cannot in good faith claim to be the first victim. And I am aware that there is another victim who bravely came forward before I did. I would like to believe that the court will not wait to deliver justice until Adam Michael Toombs victimizes another per- person. And while I never wanted to be a mother, it should not mean that my rapist would be allowed to continue to be a father when better options exist for the child. Thank you for listening.